Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Claire Pomeroy, and I am the president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation in New York City. Um, and it is a fantastic job because I get to work with fascinating people, and I get to work on a really important mission, which is to improve health by accelerating support for biomedical research. And we do that by giving the Lasker Awards through education and advocacy. And one part of that is that we actually work with APSA to uh, jointly present the Lasker APSA lecture. I hope some of you got to hear Dr. Somers when he was here. So um, when we uh, uh, agreed to be on this panel, they asked us to talk a little bit about ourselves. And I think when people ask um, others to talk about themselves, it's, for me, really important to talk about our core values. What drives us to do what we do? What brought us to these fields of biomedical research? And I think our core values are very often determined by our earliest experiences. And for me, those earliest experiences were really around the fact that I grew up in foster care. And while I had foster parents who literally saved my life, I saw a lot of other foster kids who uh, weren't so fortunate. And I saw that society was willing to throw away kids. And from that, I got my core values, which I would say revolve around social justice and equity and caring for the vulnerable. And in fact, if any of you tore yourself away from this conference and watched the Bruce Jenner interview um, last night, he talked about giving a voice to the voiceless. And I think that's really what my core values are all about. So I think that's actually why I became an HIV doctor. And I became an HIV doctor at the very, very beginning of the epidemic when, and for all of the APSA people, it was before there were any medicines. And all we could do was really support people as they died. And we had to fight the system, and we had to fight the stigma. And you can see how that fit with the core values of caring for, for, for the vulnerable. So I started out at, um, at, at, in uh, the Minneapolis VA being an HIV doctor. I was also a researcher looking at cytomegalovirus and toxoplasmosis and some of the diseases that um, HIV doctors cared about. And um, then I got this great new job at the University of Kentucky, I was the ID division chief, and I thought I was this incredibly, you know, sophisticated HIV doctor, and I got down there to the HIV clinic in Kentucky, and I found out that I didn't know what I was doing, because this was rural HIV, and I didn't think about the fact that my patients didn't have refrigerators, and I had to not prescribe them medications that required refrigeration. And really, this was about third world HIV. Um, it was a disease of poverty. And so I had to relearn um, all about these things called social determinants, the social determinants of health. And they really were powerful and really were clear. And out of that experience came my realization of the importance of um, changing the system. And I think one of the fantastic things about medicine is that we're in a position to change both individual lives and the system. So um, I've taken more than my share of time talking about myself, but I got to go on and be the um, uh, executive associate dean and then vice chancellor and dean at the University of California, Davis, where I really was responsible for take, making sure that individual lives got taken care of but how do we run our healthcare system? How do we value innovation? How do we value the individual patient? And I think that's the fantastic thing about medicine, is that we have the opportunity to do all of these different things, from patient care to research to the business aspects, but ultimately to making society a better place. And what Dr. Collins said, I think, is really true for everyone in this room. What we all ultimately want to do, what I ultimately wanted to do, was make a difference. And I think medicine lets us do that. 
Okay. Well, what Claire said then. Um, I'm a, <laughs> my name is Hillary Reno. I'm an assistant professor in infectious disease and hospitalist medicine at WashU. Um, I did my MD PhD at University of Illinois. My PhD is in entomology. I've always followed a largely non-traditional field. Um, and at some point I got uh, sucked into clinical medicine. I worked um, and I've been at WashU uh, since 2002 where I did my all my tra clinical training, my uh, chief resident year, and my fellowship. Uh, but after I had my first child, I decided to go part-time. I had been, I was part-time for seven or eight years until last year um, when a public health crisis hit St. Louis. Um, my specialty through fellowships, a long story, became uh, STIs. Uh, I'm an HIV provider as well, um, but um, I'm concentrating on healthcare delivery uh, for sexually transmitted infections in St. Louis. If you don't know about St. Louis, we're usually ranked per capita rates within the city, number one and number two in gonorrhea and chlamydia. Well, that's now my job. So um, I, uh, I, maybe by the time I retire. Uh, but I am uh, started a clinical research program um, as of last year. So I've transitioned from more the clinical educator and clinician uh, to incorporating more research uh, into my uh, current position. Um, but I also continue uh, in hospitalist medicine. Um, and my baby's going to kindergarten in August. And hallelujah. Um, <laughs> it's been a good time to transition to something like that now. Hi, uh, I'm Hannah Stevens. Um, actually, Hillary and I spent many years together at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. That's where I did my MD PhD as well, and I did it in neuroscience. I'm a child psychiatrist, so I'm a general psychiatrist with specialty in child psychiatry, and I was very fortunate to do a uh, joint residency fellowship postdoc at uh, Yale Child Study Center, and that's where I began my um, faculty career as well. I had a small lab there until this, the end of last year, exploring early brain development and the risk factors in the early brain for later psychiatric d disorders. Um, and then at the end of the year, I moved my lab to the University of Iowa in Iowa City, just a short distance across the prairie. And now um, I'm continuing in that joint career of um, clinical child psychiatry uh, I specialize mostly in ADHD and autism and a basic science lab where we use animal models to try to understand uh, risk factors for psychiatric illness. Well, thank you for your introductions. Uh, could we please take some questions from the audience? And when you go up to ask a question, please go ahead and use that microphone because I think they're recording us. Yeah, so I was just going to say, happy to answer any questions about any aspect, you know. I think we have already raised lots of different aspects. Um, so we heard a little bit from Dr. Reno about how she made the decision about balancing family and, and work. And I was wondering if each of the rest of the panelists could speak to that, whether you have a family and, and how you were able to strike that balance in your career. Thanks. I'll, uh, I'll start off then because um, a couple of things just came to my mind real quick and um, since I just told you about the fact that I made a move, I can explain to you that move was partially motivated by having a balance in my life between my work and my personal life. So I'm originally from the Chicago area and uh, my mom still lives here and my, uh, my husband's family also lives here. We have two young children, nine and four, and we had them out in Connecticut and we had no family and you know, we made it work and everybody was happy and everybody was doing well. But we missed things, you know. We missed the chance to have grandparents there for all the birthdays. And we missed the chance to be there for the grandparents' birthdays. And, you know, to be completely frank, um, while I was out there and trying to find uh, a way to come back and be closer to home, my father passed away. And I was really, really sad that I had to have, um, you know, made that trade-off. I think it was very, very important the decision I made to go out there and to get the training I got, and no one could have planned uh, necessarily what happened, but um, I made the decision in the end to take another really wonderful, excellent job, um, completely uh, great for my scientific and clinical career to move to University of Iowa, but the decision to leave behind many of my mentors and a place I was very, very happy scientifically um, I did that in order to be closer to my family and so to have my kids have 
extended family nearby and um, and to be there for my mom and for my in-laws so just one decision I made in my career that um, uh, was influenced by those balances so I think it's important to remember that everybody has family it just looks different and um, in my case I was fortunate to have a wonderful husband who had the good sense to become a writer so that he could do his career um, wherever I decided to go on the academic um, ladder. Um, and uh, it is true that having a life partner who um, supports you is, is really critical in these jobs that become very time consuming um, and, and, and require an immense amount of, of energy and often, and often require sacrifices on, on both sides. Uh, we don't have um, children, uh, one highly anthropomorphized dog, but, which takes a lot of time. Um, but my husband is in charge of, of Rufus. Um, and for me, one of the interesting things to watch has, has, has been the generational change. So, um, and I think it is important for young people today to, to have a sense of the history, because it was very different when I was in medical school. And, you know, they weren't 50-50 classes. Um, and I, today I think that young people, both men and women, are demanding that they have more balance in, in work life. And I, I personally think that's a very healthy thing. I think that academic medicine, in particular, has been very slow to recognize that, and that um, I always thought one of my jobs as a leader in academic medicine was to make sure that we did as much as we possibly could to accommodate that um, positive change, which I saw about desiring work-life balance. And so um, that comes to the system change. Um, you know, are there things like daycare, you know, at the institution? Um, are there... You know, are there understandings that um, call schedules have to be accommodating? Are there um, parental leaves and those sorts of things? And so I think it's important that leaders do that. We see it more and more, but academic medicine still has a long ways to go. Yeah, so um, I think I had the not very wise combination of choices of going into OB and having four kids. And um, things worked out. I was very lucky in a lot of things. My parents moved to me, um, so that was nice. And we built up a very nice network of daycare providers um, where different, our babysitters always had friends who could pinch hit if they were sick or whatever. So we lucked out in that respect. Um, but I agree that um, it was really tough for a few years because it was before the 80 hour work week when I had my second kid. And so I was working 120 hours a week, most weeks. Um, and my husband wrote a little booklet that he hasn't published, but it's called How to Cook with One Hand <laughs> because he would have a baby in a front pack and another baby um, either grabbing his leg or on his hip and he would be making dinner and I wouldn't be home two to three nights a week. So, you know, I was very lucky also in my choice or I don't know, his choice or whatever. We, we worked <laughs> out, he's very supportive and he's always done, you know, 50 plus percent even though he has a very busy career as well. So, um, uh, so we got through the, the sort of baby period and so my youngest child is nine and my oldest is 17. Um, so now we're racing through junior year of high school and trying to support, you know, the older daughter through her crises of deciding what college to go to and stuff. But it's, it's actually worked out. Um, and um, one choice I made essentially was that um, up to this point, I've done career and home. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of me time. I've never actually really needed it very much. But um, that's something that y you have to know before you walk into these things. How much sort of outside time do you need? And, 
And I think had I felt like I needed more me time, I would have had fewer kids, but I really wanted to have a lot of kids. Um, and it's been very rewarding. Um, but um, yeah, so it's worked out for me. Um, I have one other thought that was kind of, um, well, I'll get to it later, I suppose. But um, yeah, so there's now I think things are easier. I mean, 80 hours still seems like a lot of hours a week, um, but it, it I think is a lot more manageable. At least when I see the trainees, they do get to see their families a bit more. I mean, I have to say, my second year of residency, I don't remember much at all <laughs> of it um, because we had to get back to work because of the, the other thing is the guilt, right? So if everybody else is pulling three shifts a week and you're on maternity leave, um, you don't want to be out for too long. Um, so at that time, I took four weeks off with that child. Um, so. Things have changed, I think, a lot for the better. There have been system-wide changes, the hospitalist um, uh, roles and having um, ancillary staff or um, you know, um, other professionals helping out, especially in OB, has been really helpful. And I really encourage leaders to think about um, helping people um, do these things. I know a lot of my um, resident friends um, and even in fellowship friends put off having families. Um, because of the demands. Um, and I think, um, you know, people should have the choices to make, you know, the ability to make choices when it's good for their personal lives, not necessarily being um, impacted too strongly about, you know, you, you have to choose career or family. I just want to say, I think the system has changed, and I think Miriam had sort of sent us some prep things to think about. And one of the things she asked was, what have women sort of uniquely brought to academic medicine or something like that, Mary? I'm probably not doing justice to your question, but I think that women have in some ways forced medicine to consider the priorities that all people in it have, not just women. Uh, the fact that they sh everyone wants to have family time. So I think that's... And, and I would also add that um, we've all emphasized that perhaps things have gotten better, but it's very important to remember that um, there are, there's still an incredible leaky pipeline in academic medicine. And so that if you look at every level, if it's 50-50 medical school graduates, men and women, then it, it goes down in academic medicine for each level, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, dean. And I can tell you when I was a dean, you know, it got very repetitive that I was the only woman in the room when there was a dean meeting, right? And, and so the, it, 20 years ago they said, well, just wait, okay? The pipeline is, gonna be, is being fed now and just wait and it will get better. Well, it hasn't gotten better. And so I think we have an obligation to look at the other aspects, um, you know, things beyond just pay. And so we have to look at the culture. And we're all responsible for the culture of our organizations, right? And so when you're the, the classic experience, you're in the meeting, you're the only woman, and you say something, and then it goes around to the men, and John says something, and everyone goes, John, what a great idea. And you go, uh, 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 right? And, and when I ask groups of women if they've ever had that experience, they all raise their hands. Mm -hmm. So it's that, those micro cuts that come it's that unconscious bias that comes. And so I want to be very careful that we continue to take responsibility for working on that, that cultural change that needs to happen. To kind of move up, to touch on that subject, um, WashU has started this year a fellowship for women in uh, medicine group, FWIM is the acronym. Um, I'm the department, the division liaison for that. And it's, um, it's been interesting because it's really built off of a lot of the lean in principles that I think that's part of uh, one thing you brought up. And Sarah Sandberg does, has done an amazing job. Um, the articles in the New York Times recently um, really bringing this to the forefront to the point where at our faculty meeting in January, my division uh, chief, who is a very well known, respected HIV researcher, um, him and his co 
chair uh, of the division, also a man, uh, MD, PhD researcher, um, in a faculty where a third of us are women uh, in ID, which isn't too bad, actually. Um, but the first thing on the agenda was talking about Sarah Sandberg's uh, New York Times uh, column that had come out a few weeks before. They circulated it through the division to the faculty. Uh, we talked about it at the meeting for a good five to ten minutes, and they made it a commitment to talk about women's issues and, you know, recognition of, of other disparities in the medical profession. Uh, throughout the year in our division conferences. I, I'll be honest, I never thought I'd see a day when that would happen. <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, I'm only 42, but still, uh, you know, I've been in academic medicine for going on 10 years now, and I didn't think I would, that women's issues would be number one on a division um, faculty meeting agenda, but we were, and I was very impressed. Um, and it's, um, you know, really it's coming. He has made the point to me before, and negotiations for my position, that he recognizes that there's issues there of gender and he feels that if men don't make start to make the changes since that pipeline has continued to happen that it will still be an issue and like you were told we were told that the change was coming with us um, and now that I was just in a meeting where they say oh it's gonna be like you guys it's gonna be with you guys <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm not so sure it's like the slippery slope uh, of, of the changes coming but you know I think he's right that this is very much of a it's a it's everyone's issue um, and it's something that um, isn't just with gender and medicine, but with minorities as well. Um, I happen to be uh, moving very quickly into LGBT uh, issues because of my work. Um, and I think that's, that's also a group that's um, not well recognized. And I think all of these sort of health disparity problems that we see in our patients and patient care um, flows upward into academic medicine and the makeup of, uh, of our physicians and our providers. And so I think this is, in St. Louis, it's a hotbed issue. Um, my STD clinic is not very far from Ferguson, um, and so it's something that we're really starting to look at um, very reflectively regionally, um, and I, I really hope that the change is here. Um, I guess time will tell, so. Change will only be here, though, if, if, if people make it happen. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the work you're doing, and you're talking about the, the work your division chief is doing, and that and that's you know, really wonderful. Um, and it's actually great to see so many men in the audience because this, it can't be, this can't be a woman's issue. It can't be women always speaking up, just like it can't always be black folks speaking up about Af African Americans and minorities or, you know, LGBT persons speaking up about, about um, uh, those issues. And so it, the tragedy is if we don't take full advantage of all of the brain power out there, then we're not taking full advantage of all of the people that can make medicine great. I think, and I'd love to hear Claire's sort of um, thoughts on this and as well as Hillary and Hannah, but I think partly as an MD, PhD, and as a woman, um, we have a lot of hard choices because um, we split ourselves into pieces every day all the time and so the problem is in each of our pieces we're being judged against people who do it full-time right so how do you be a good mom you know or parent or whatever it doesn't really matter how do you be a good parent um, when you cannot go to every um, you know every party at school every field trip I just missed you know last week I missed a concert you know middle school concert you can't be there every single time um, how do you be a good physician when you are 20% clinical? Um, how do you uh, compete for NIH grants when your 20% clinical is not really 20% clinical because you're doing your notes until late at night? Um, so how do you, you know, and you're getting calls from the patient that you saw last Tuesday when it's like Friday. So how do you balance all of those things when the bar is not getting any, high, any lower for any of these criteria? Um, that's really one of the challenges I face all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point in my career, I'm just trying to keep my head above water <laughs> and not miss any major deadlines. Yeah, I, this is an issue I think a lot about and have thought a lot about through my training and through my early career of this idea, you know, getting back to your question, which was about balance, you know, between multiple things that pull on what you want to do with your time. And I had a mentor 
um, who once told me, um, you know, she was kind of reflecting on a women's group that she was in where one woman was saying, you know, it's just not fair. In this system, I should be able to do this and I should be able to do this and all the hundreds of things she wanted to do. And we all have a hundred things we wanted to do. And this mentor very wisely said, all of us have to make choices. And when you choose to do something, you are going to have to close the door on something else. And that was so liberating to me <laughs> as a woman to, uh, you know, and as somebody who has multiple things I want to do in my life, which isn't just women, uh, to say, you know, I don't have to be superwoman in 10, 100 different areas. You know, when I decide that I want to do research, I'm not going to be the chair of the PTO at my kid's school. And I'm not going to be scrapbooking all of their childhood, you know, experiences. And I, you know, I, I feel okay with that. But everybody has to make their own personal decision about that. And that's really, really important that we respect that people make different choices. And that, um, you know, my choice to, um, you know, not go to all the PTO events or whatever, you know, that doesn't make me an imperfect parent. It just makes me a parent who does it differently. And my choice maybe to not have a huge, as huge a lab as the person next to me doesn't make me an imperfect researcher. It just makes me a researcher who does it differently. Um, and I think that's a really important message that I hope that you will all take uh, from this. And I hope no one feels they have to be a super person. Um. So um, I, I'll admit that when I went part time, there was judgment, a lot of judgment. Um, and a lot of that judgment was me judging myself. At some point, I'll keep this part short, because, but it took me years to get to this point. I realized that what everyone else thought of me didn't matter, that I answered to four people, myself, my husband, and my two boys. Everyone else, well, they can, they can deal with their issues on their own. <laughs> and, and, and that was a lesson I wish I had learned in my 20s that I didn't learn until my late 30s, and it was really unfortunate. Because once I learned that lesson, I became so much happier in everything I did, and it, everything was just easier. Um, so I... Lewis B. Sullivan, who, uh, MD, Dr. Sullivan, who was Secretary of Health and Human Services under the uh, Elder Bush, was, gave grand rounds for us a couple weeks ago. And one of my colleagues, who's African American, Dr. Sullivan's African American, um, asked him, What do I do? Can I go, should I go back to my community? Should I be in public health policy? Should I be in academic medicine? And as an African American physician, where should I go? And his answer to him was twofold. The first was, Do it all, because we need you. And then he said, but my, my real answer is be happy. And that was, to me, that was incredibly profound. And I think it applies to everyone. We all want to do it all, but ultimately just be happy because then you're going to be making the right decisions for you, the ones you love, and for your career. So I think it's pretty, it sounds easy, but it took me too many years to learn. So, so the original question was always, can women have it all? And it was the wrong question. Mm -hmm. Right, because no one gets it all. Um, so I agree that it, it, is, a, it is about choices. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was, you know, there can be different phases of your career, and they're just like they're different phases of your life, and you can emphasize different things at different points in your life and in your career, and not try and do it all, all the time. On a very practical level, I think there are also ways that you can help yourself get over some of the guilt. Um, I mean, I always tell young people, the first time you get a paycheck, use it to hire a house cleaner. Okay? I mean, this is, this is very important. Or, or a nanny or, you know, a dog walker. Whatever it is that you need, um, that your time and is, is more important than the money. And since there are too many things to do, don't do the stuff that you can give to somebody else to do. Yeah. That was the thing I actually forgot, which was um, early in your career, a lot of delayed gratification for things. Like we literally spent um, a half of, uh, well actually half of our salary, all of my salary on daycare <laughs> so that I could, well actually in home when they were little mm -hmm. because I felt when we tried to do out-of-home daycare, I was so guilty all the time, I couldn't focus. 
And so once we got somebody really wonderful at home, I could leave the house at five o'clock in the morning and come home at eight at night and know that my kids were not only safe, but that they loved the person they were with and they were loved by that person. And so it just felt so much nicer for me to know that um, and let me be effective when I was at work. I think people uh, in the physician scientist world understand delayed gratification. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken by the psychiatrist. <laughs> I also think it's really important for um, women, all people, but women, to advocate for themselves to get the resources that they need in, in order to accomplish what mm -hmm. they want to accomplish, mm -hmm. too. And, and so women too often have, are trained in our society to try and please everybody without asking for things, right? So, um, you know. Have you honed your negotiating skills? Um, and and have, have, you, have you figured out how to say no? Have you figured out how to say, listen, um, you know, I know that you need a woman on every search committee, but it's not going to be me, okay? Um, and, and in fact, I want to be on the finance committee because that's, that's where the power is. And I don't want to be on another women's committee. Um, so. You know, so looking at yourself to make sure that you get the resources you need to be effective is also an important thing to do. Hello. Um, you've all shared some wonderful advice that you've received from people um, throughout your career. Um, could you share with us some of the bad advice you received and then now with the benefit of hindsight, what you learned from it? I got a lot of this. I know. All right. <laughs> So, so Mary, I'll pair this with one of Mary's questions, which made for some interesting conversations on the drive up here with my husband, which was, um, what are some of the low parts of your career? So that goes with the bad advice I got. Um, right after I had my first child, when I asked um, someone if, uh, if I could go part, come back to fellowship as part-time, because I really did not want to work full-time um, anymore. And um, she told me that, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to real reveal the person's gender, um, but <laughs> this person said to me, well, First of all, you need to stop breastfeeding your child. You're too emotional. Um, you need to uh, hire a housekeeper, which is actually a good, a good <laughs> thing. But she told me that I must have a nanny and that I needed someone to do my laundry. I shouldn't waste my time doing laundry. Um, and amongst, and it, it went on. She basically told me how to run my household um, without regard to what I enjoy doing without regard to my marriage. Um, by, uh, we're having our 20th wedding anniversary next year. And so um, I, she did not know me. <laughs> and so that was actually a very low part of my career because I felt torn between what was expected of me and the advice I was given and what I was feeling and who I thought I was. Um, but working through that then <laughs> led me to the the understanding that I needed to do what was best for me um, without regard to what other people thought. Um, yeah, uh, by the way, when you're breastfeeding, you have no hormones, so you're not hormonal, okay, just so you know. <laughs> and I extended breastfeeding both, breastfeeding both of my children with no problems whatsoever, so. I still resent that. <laughs> I've tried to forget it all so quickly that I, I can't remember any of it actually. <laughs> but I know I've had bad advice. <laughs> I think for me it was often advice that I gave myself. Um, one of the main sources of bad advice. Um, and, and that was um, a, a little bit to your point about the me time, is that I really thought if I just worked harder, I could actually get everything done. And so I just added more and more and more hours onto the day and took on more and more responsibilities. And so I think the um, advice that I wish I had gotten that I didn't give myself was um, to set some limits. Um, do fewer things better. Um, don't try and, and do everything that you're, you're asked to do. Um, and I think that one of, the, one of the things that I realized sort of as, as I made the mistakes was to um, really focus on what was important to me, again, those core values, um, and to realize that if you don't take a break sometimes, you're not gonna be as good. Um, 
that some of the best ideas, the most creative things, I, uh, ideas that I had came after I slowed down for just long enough to focus on myself, take a break, and then you actually can do your job better. I don't know. Again, I don't, I've sort of blocked out some stuff. Um, I think some of it's not just advice, it's just attitude and things that people say um, about uh, women, about being a woman, about trying to, quote, compete with men. Um, I guess the most egregious one is, um, I actually, so, I think I was two weeks out from one of my deliveries and um, they were doing resident interviews. And um, since I'm one of the few basic science people in my division, I think I'm the only one now, but um, they wanted to have somebody represented in the interview. So they asked me to come in and um, an interview and I was like, fine, but I have to bring my baby because he's eating every two hours, right? So I brought him in and one of the senior folks in my division made snide remarks about me being always pregnant and always breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. I was like, look, this is two weeks postpartum and I'm at work, you know? Mm -hmm. Give me a break. <laughs> so you just have to let it kind of roll off, I think, sometimes. Even if it's a very well-respected senior person, they, they can be wrong, I think. Well, you have to know when to let it roll off and when to confront it. Um, and, and, and that's not always an easy thing to know. Um, and it does depend upon the power relationships of when, when you can safely confront it and constructively <laughs> confront it. Um, but I think that is one of the hardest things, is making the decision of when to just say, yes, you know, resilience is important and, and I'm, I, you know, they're wrong and I'm going to move forward. And, and when to sort of say, that's not acceptable. And, and, and to mobilize whatever forces are available to you to fight it. Um, and that has to be an individual decision and an individual case, I think. Yeah. Kind of short here. Um, my question is with regard to uh, the leaky pipeline for women and minorities and many um, underrepresented groups in science and medicine. Um, what is it that's helped you guys to succeed at keeping, to make it to the next step that you have seen others not do and then sort of fall off the pipeline? Does that make sense? Like what have you done that others have not done that's helped you to sort of stay progressing in academic medicine? Does that make sense? So I do think that persistence and, and resilience um, is really important. You have to love what you're doing. And if you truly love medicine, then for me, it was never a question of stopping doing it. It was like, this is, this is you know, such a, a wonderful honor and, and, and opportunity. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it, which doesn't mean that, that there weren't low points. So you have to, you have to love what you're doing. You have to figure out who your champions are and who your advocates are and, and turn to them when you, when you need them. Um, I think that um, you, you have to also be practical um, and not be too hard on yourself. Um, so for me, the, the networking, um, the other people um, were what was helpful to get through that so that I got to those highs where you got to experience the, the passion. Yeah, I think seeking people out has been a huge part of that. So um, for anything, I'm never, I'm never dissuaded from going to ask advice. For just sitting down with someone, I, you know, the, I've been very fortunate to have the kind of mentors and peer mentors, my colleagues at my same level, who don't mind if I just, you know, I. Even now, you know, in today's world, I text them <laughs> and I say, look, I, I'm having this problem, you know, can you give me some advice? And it's just so helpful to realize you're not alone in the problems you're having um, and to get so many different perspectives. And then I, uh, there was a second idea, which was that um, uh, you had said, don't uh, feel like you have to be perfect, right? And um, I think knowing that you can do it your own way 
and it doesn't have to be the same way as everyone else. I think that that's something, you know, again, back to that idea that women may bring something to academic medicine that's a little different, and we may make that culture different. You have to see that you may individually make your culture different in your little workspace, and it may be very different from all the other people around you, and it may be very different than everyone you've ever met who does what you do, but that's actually the way we advance things in medicine is to do things differently. So don't be afraid of that. I would say two things. One is remembering this is a marathon and not a sprint, which lots of people have told me. It's excellent advice um, to have that long-term vision of where you may want to be years down the road. Um, and if you get, if it takes you longer to get there, so be it. Um, and then the other thing is having, like everyone has talked about and hinted on, is mentors. I actually took the PhD approach. I've built a committee. Um, that's like Hillary's committee and I've told them you're on my committee and a couple one of them is an MD PhD so he immediately understood what that meant and the others I explained it to them <laughs> um, and and I said this means you know the four of you are you know on call to me or text to me as necessary um, and they each have their role uh, in in their mentorship of me um, and I look to them um, constantly and I think that w for when I've seen women fall out, and it's mainly been women that I've seen fall out, that is something I've always felt they lacked, um, was someone to be, to say, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to change your vision. It's okay to do this. Um, just what's your long-term vision? How do we get you there? Um, and then I think they've also lacked advice from a variety of different voices too. And, and w one other thing I would add, particularly for women um, to, to keep them in the academic pipeline is to understand that I believe that for women some of the traditional sort of credentials are really important. So um, it, to stay in academics you have to pu publish papers, you have to get grants, and I think that's particularly important for women to have that, that credential. Um, when I decided that I wanted to go into some of the more leadership aspects, I went back to school and got an MBA. I think it's particularly important for women to have the, the credential of the degree. So it's great there are all these PhDs up here. Um, but um, say finances, that it was helpful to have the MBA degree. So making sure that you have, um, have those credentials can help, you, can help you stay in the pipeline too. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes I wonder whether that is partly just because, I mean, it is that we're sometimes judged on a different level. I think also, it also validates it to ourselves. Um, I see guys, and, and it's changing, again, it's changing, but even in my trainees, I think the guys have a lot more confidence in themselves and their ability to succeed. Um, I have women who I've trained who I thought were cut out for the academic track, and they're like, I'm never gonna make it, never. And they, for example, went into industry, which is not a bad option, and people do wonderful things in industry, and it's actually really good for industry to have these, these women there, um, but they basically didn't think they could cut it in today's very competitive um, uh, atmosphere. But I have guys who are like, I'm gonna do it, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, they're missing some critical part because you need a lot of different parts, right? You have to think independently, be good with your hands. Um, you have to have published, you know, good papers and things like that. And, um, and you have to be able to write, right? And so if you're missing any of those things, it's really going to be hard to succeed. And I've had people miss, like, a major part and still feel like they could cut it. Um, I'm not saying it's universal, but I think I see in my own trainees that tendency. So part of it is um, that some people call it ambition, um, some people call it self-esteem, um, whatever it is, the confidence that you're going to go for something and you're going to eventually somehow not take any no's along the way. You have to, uh, the, the sort of persistence is very important, just plugging away at it over and over and over again, throwing in another grant and getting it, you know, triage, tr trying again. Someday it's gonna get through, you know? Um, just have, but knowing that that's what you wanna do and knowing that it's worth doing, right? And somehow having some sense that you can do at least part of it better than anybody else um, uh, is, is important. 
Um, otherwise, it's so easy to drop off. And that if, if you do something and you don't do it exactly right, then you just do it again. Um, and, and, I, and I do think that, in, at least in our culture, boys are often, more often brought up in sports. They figure out you lose some games, and then you go play the next game, and then you win, right? And girls aren't, aren't given that experience as often. So girls have too often have this sense that if there's one failure, it means it's all over. And, and so, so to understand that you don't have to be perfect to be ultimately successful. So when I started paying attention to gender bias issues, I first read about it in the paper and I was looking at pay gap. And I thought, well, okay, but I really don't think that's going to affect me. And then I started reading more about this literature. And even for ear, nose, and throat surgeons, women get paid $16,000 less than the, than the male counterparts. And what really hit this gender discrimination fear home for me was at my own institution, IU, one of my medical school professors sued the Department of Physiology in 2012 for gender discrimination. She wasn't getting raises, she wasn't getting promoted. New male faculty were joining with less experience than her and getting paid more than her. And when I would go to her office, her office was actually a janitor's closet off the stairwell. And that makes me very concerned about gender discrimination, especially when it comes to resolving these issues. Because I just checked up on the case and it, she appealed it and it's still on the courts today. So have, what have you guys seen and do you guys have any comments about potential resolution techniques for us? I think being aware is the first step, you know, being aware that there are those biases. And then I think, you know, back to what we a couple of people had mentioned in the beginning, it's having the ability to negotiate and to have the sense that, you know, you can do it and you are doing it just as well or better than many people. So this confidence that you're worth uh, someone paying you just the same as every other person. Um, you know, the gender bias isn't going to go away. It's only by it becoming more in people's awareness that it, um, I think that it will be addressed. I think, um, you know, you just have, you have to be informed. I mean, this isn't necessarily something you guys want to be thinking about at this stage, you know, because fortunately the systems have been, things have been systematized enough that when you go to residency, they're not going to pay the female residents less than the male residents. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> So it's at the next step. So you guys don't necessarily have to worry about this, for, but you can be thinking ahead and just being informed. What are the salaries? Public institutions publish their salaries. You will be able to find that out. Having that information and going in, while it's enough to make you angry, not going in in anger uh, with a feeling that I'm angry and I'm going to get what I deserve, but going in with a, I want to be a contributing part of this faculty and I want to have this job because I'm going to be awesome at it and you're going to love that you hired me and that you paid me more than anybody else in a very positive sense. Um, work environments where these gender biases occur are collaborative pace, places. So you do have to, despite the fact that it is extremely, you know, irritating and can, you know, really, really be demoralizing, uh, still feel for your own personal, you know, expect the best of everyone until they prove you wrong. Expect the best that your chairman is going to be willing to give you the, um, you know, the salary you asked for that you deserve, that you've checked and is the salary that everyone else gets. Um, expect the best that they're going to give you the opportunities. Um, and hopefully, you know, I, I do agree that once problems enter like things like litigation, it is really, really painful and uh, often doesn't get resolved. So, you know, I think that's the only thoughts that I have. So, of course, you're right. Gender bias is real. And um, it's real in salaries, but it goes far beyond salaries, right? And it's about benefits and it's about space and it's about opportunities and it's about your voice being heard. There's a long, there's a long and, and, and deep list. And I really think that every single person needs to fight it on two levels. One, we have to look at ourselves and we have to make sure we do have our negotiating skills down. Um, we have the data when we go in there. We, we have the confidence 
when we go in there and, and ask for the fair salary or the fair lab space assignment or whatever it is. Um, we have to have leadership skills, have to have the credentials. But to, by sort of saying this is, the woman needs to figure out how to fix this, I, I think is, is, is only half of the answer. Um, the other half is that I think we all need to come together and, and demand that the systems change. So, you know, it would be much more effective if this person that you're referring to wasn't fighting this on her own. And if all of her faculty colleagues came together and said, we need a salary study. And we're going to, and it's, and it needs to be publicized. And it's going to go to the paper. And we, we need an analysis of these other things too, beyond salary. And we want the, the fact that there will be unconscious bias training for every department in this institution. And we will have a list of, of resources which this, ins this organization should provide in order to make women and men successful. Mentoring programs, daycare, lactation rooms, whatever it is. So um, I do see the need for women to stand up for themselves, but I also see the need to demand that the systems change. Well, for better or worse, I think many systems like the one that I'm in are changing to very transparent um, and productivity-based measures of how you're paid. So our clinical systems, my division actually was the pilot, um, we went to pure RVU-based. Um, so you see more patients, you write more notes, you do more consults, you get paid more. So that suddenly, very little bias left um, in, in terms of productivity and pay. However, as was mentioned, it's not all salary, it's your resources, right? What do you need to succeed in your career? And um, I had a great chair for many years. He was there when I was a resident and fellow and, and my first years as faculty. He's now the CEO of the hospital. Um, so um, the, the, the thing that you know, I realized with him is, and I'm very uncomfortable asking for things like for myself, but what worked for him um, and it continues to work with my current chair is, I set out the goals. Like, if there's a clinical research infrastructure I want to set up when I was a brand new person, I said, this is what's in it for me, this is what's in it for the department, right? We want our department to become a leading department in reproductive medicine. We don't have a good perinatal research infrastructure. And these are the resources I need. These are the things I've brought in. I need help, that sort of thing. So that it wasn't just like my own career purely, it was sort of seeing what was um, in it for everyone. I also said things, which is true, this is a good opportunity for our trainees. If we have these things, it will help them have better fellowship projects. So when they go up to defend their thesis at the boards, um, we won't have any embarrassing cases anymore where they don't pass. Um, so um, it's just looking at what's aligned in terms of everybody's motivations and then asking for the resources needed to kind of get there. So you all mentioned that mentors were extremely important throughout your careers. I was wondering how you guys found your mentors, not just when you were faculty, but even before as undergraduates in medical school, and how you can keep them around, because I've had an extremely difficult time finding mentors to kind of support me and guide me. I would say um, I had to learn my lesson. I had a poor mentor as a, my PhD research, um, and so I, I, I probably made a bad choice. Um, and then I learned from that. Uh, and so hopefully, since if you're going through a rough patch, you will learn from that. But I, my mentors um, more recently have been chosen uh, based on the skills that I lack. Um, and so I'm doing a lot of, starting to do a lot more um, policy work. I'm building a coalition in the region. Um, we have our first meeting next month on May 12th. Keep your fingers crossed for me because it might be a rough go. Um, but we have, you know, I've had to work with um, public health departments and politicians and um, academic, other academic institutions to build this group of people who are going to work on our regional problems. And so I pick one of my mentors as someone who knows the history of the situation in St. Louis. Um, even though I've been there for almost 15 years, it, it goes much deeper than that. And someone who 
understands the mo people's motivations uh, and can help me work on our very diplomatic approach. And so it was a weakness that I, I was missing that she's filled. Um, and I've just found her to be a very wise voice. Um, mentors that, um, I, I actually started picking mentors that are a lot like me um, because in some ways and their approach, how I, I've seen them, how they work in their community. Um, I tend to be kind of a shy person and so I've picked people that are pretty, that are kind of quiet. Um, but I, I think sometimes the quiet, yeah, you wouldn't know I was quiet based on today, mm -hmm. would you? Um, <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think quiet people have a lot to say sometimes and so they, um, I identify with them. I think that was one of the problems I made when I picked my PhD researcher, very different personality for me. And so um, and many times I was uncomfortable and it just wasn't my element. Um, and these people understand me better. Uh, and I think they are able to delve a little deeper and help um, bring out things in me that I didn't recognize I had um, because we identify on a, a very uh, d deeper level than just, uh, hey, we work at the same institution. So good luck. I had a similar experience for my PhD, Hillary. Not the best choice, but you know, a good person. Um, but I think that um, what I learned from that was that you have to have more than just the one. I should have worked, I should have, you know, we talked about committees. I should have leaned more on committees to develop those relationships with other faculty on my committee and those people become more mentors. Um, so having multiple mentors is really critical because you will never, be able to seamlessly get everything met by one individual person and mentors are going to change over time um, and so if you have multiple they can overlap you may lose one but your other two are you know going through and then you pick up another and then you lose one of those two and because your life changes and your interests change but I actually think the most important perspective on maintaining relationships is to recognize that it's a two-way street and mentors don't always know what to do for you. You have to come with an agenda. It can be a tiny agenda. It can simply be, you know, I'm in the middle of my semester and I want to tell you how my classes are going or would you, you know, and I, or I'm trying to make decisions for classes for next time. But, you know, um, I think sometimes People talk very, very vaguely about mentorship. And when you first start thinking about getting mentors, you think it's simply going to be like just this wise person, you know, giving you advice and sitting down with you. But mentors don't always know what's going to be best for you. So if you come in with at least some starting places, like I'd, I'd love to talk to you about your career, ask them questions, say, I have this question. I wonder if you can help me. And those things will change over time. Um, you know those questions and so the mentor hearing from you what's changing for you and what you need is is really good um so uh i think that that's really good and i think long distance mentors can be really helpful too so if you meet people at national meetings that you think you know you might be simpatico with you know just be like could i you know just bother you on email if i have questions about career or about the field or you know, and um, I think you can have distance mentors that you don't talk to very often even that can be really important for you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but I do want to thank the audience for your insightful questions as well as our panel members um, for exploring these ideas that I think are really important. Um, with that, I'd like to close the panel and also remind you that we have a dinner at 7.30, not at 7, so you have plenty of time to get ready. Um, thank you for joining us. Yeah.